Uh, something to remind you uh, where we are in the course, a topic we started on Wednesday. We started asking the question, do players actually reach equilibria in games? We've been spending all this time assuming that systems are at equilibrium, and can, when and how can that be justified? And not only can they reach an equilibrium in principle, but can they do so quickly? And again, the reason we're doing that is to justify equilibrium analysis. So one special case of that, you know, when you care about the objective function value, uh, that's a price of anarchy analysis. Of course, there's other reasons you might care. Uh, you might focus on equilibria as well. So on Wednesday, what we did is we talked about one very important types of dynamics, best response dynamics. That's where players take turns going one at a time. While you're not at a pure Nash equilibrium, a player updates to its best response given what the other K minus one players are currently doing. So best response dynamics make a lot of sense in potential games. That was the focus on Wednesday, where they're guaranteed to converge eventually to pure Nash equilibria. And we studied when do they converge quickly and when do you converge to outcomes that are almost as good as Nash equilibria. And so today the plan is to discuss a second equally important type of learning dynamics uh, called no regret dynamics. So these dynamics also make very good sense beyond potential games. Potential games cover a lot of the applications that we care about, but not all of them. So no regret dynamics have very broad sweep. And we'll also see that a bonus is they converge to an approximate equilibrium very quickly. Now it's not going to be a Nash equilibrium, it'll be something else we mentioned in passing and we'll talk about again today called coarse correlated equilibria. So those are some of the reasons to care about uh, no regret dynamics. Now the sort of foundations of regret minimization happen first just with this in a single player context and so the bulk of the lecture we're just going to be thinking about there's one player trying to make decisions playing against an adversary or playing against nature so at the end of the lecture I'll tie in all of this single player discussion to the meaning in games where you have lots of players playing against each other okay but for the next 45 minutes plus we're just going to focus on on a single player so here's the setup So there's a set of actions, and for this entire lecture, n will denote the number of actions, and these are always the same over time. Even the binary case is interesting, so at times in the lecture, if you like, think about there even just being two actions. And so then this player will have to make decisions, meaning pick an action from A over time. So there's going to be a time horizon capital T. In this lecture, we're going to think of capital T as known to the player. On the exercise set, I'll ask you to extend the guarantees today to where the time horizon is unknown as well. But for today, think of capital T as known. And here's what happens at each time step. So you have to pick an action, a strategy. You are allowed to randomize, and as we'll see, it's essential that you randomize. So at each time step, you pick a mixed distribution. say PT over the actions A and then an adversary having seen the distribution that you've chosen now picks a cost vector which indicates for each action that you might have chosen or that you might choose randomly uh, what cost you'll incur for that action okay and we're going to assume that the costs are bounded. In particular, for today, we'll be always assuming that the costs are real numbers between 0 and 1. So if you want to think about a routing game or something like that, imagine we've scaled all of the payoffs, excuse me, all of the costs, so that they lie between uh, 0 and 1. Okay? So then, an action is chosen at random from the mixed strategy that you committed to. And then your cost is, as promised, just the part of the cost vector corresponding to the action you wound up picking. Okay. So the freedom, of course, is how do you choose the mixed strategy PT at each time step T? How do you even reason about what a good strategy might be? Okay. Now, uh, right, so what are some examples? So, you know, you could imagine these actions being sort of different investment strategies. Maybe even in the binary case for a single stock, it could be to buy or sell a stock. And the cost indicates uh, how much you win or lose, depending on which action that you chose. You know, if you want, you can imagine these actions as being routes from home to work. And these are different sort of ways you might drive to work in the morning. And the costs indicate uh, the delays 
during rush hour traffic that particular morning. Eventually, when we go back to the multiplayer case with games, the action set is just going to be the strategy set of a single player, and this cost vector is going to be induced by the strategies S minus I chosen by the other K minus one players. Okay, so eventually, that's how we'll instantiate this in the game setting. All right. So, you know, the first time you see this, I think you might rightfully think, well, if this is a game, it seems a little unfair. It seems a little stacked against us, right? So, uh, we've got to go first, which is kind of annoying. Right? So we go first, and the adversary goes second, uh, and can penalize the strategies we're likely to take. Right? So we need to understand what is it, what is it, you know, what can we even hope to try to accomplish in this regret minimization setting? Question? Is there any reason why the adversary couldn't just set all the costs to one? So we'll get to it. Right. Yeah. So what can we hope to prove? So, three observations that govern the best case scenario for what we might be able to accomplish. So the first observation is that what's not realistic as a comparison is the best sequence of actions we could have taken in hindsight. Or if you like, the best sequence of actions, meaning minimum cost sequence of actions, we could have taken had we known all of the cost vectors in advance. Okay, so I'll let you think about while I write on the board, think a little bit about, you know, if we wanted to prove a statement that says we have an algorithm that does almost as well as if we knew all the CTs up front, you know, why, why does that seem hard to pull off? So that is, if we sum over all time steps, oops, on each time step we look at the minimum over the options of the costs. So I claim this is way too strong a benchmark to measure the performance of our algorithms, which of course do not know the future, do not know the cost vector now or later when it has to make a decision. So it seems like a uh, Anyone have a sort of simple suggestion of why this would be hard to do or impossible to do? Yes. So if there's only like two actions, yeah. Um, I mean, isn't part of it that the adversaries, like the cost is dependent on what strategy you select? Sure, so concretely. So what I'm looking for is, can, like, how could the adversary make this really small? And yet, every algorithm could be very big, have very big cost. I mean, so the example where all the costs are won all the time is actually an easy example in a sense, because there's nothing you can do. Everything is equally well. So I mean, if, if the input is a bad input, you know, you'll never regret any decisions, right? All decisions were bad. So the, what you're worried about with an algorithm is that there was some you know, awesome way to make decisions, and you totally missed it. You blew it. And so if this is our benchmark, then there will be examples where that's the case. No matter how smart you are in crafting your algorithm, you can be very far away from the best action sequence in hindsight. So imagine there are even just two actions, okay? And on every day, you know, so you have two ways of going from home to work, and every day there's going to be a traffic jam on one of them and not the other. Okay, so one will have cost zero and one will have cost one. Okay, and the rub, of course, is you have no idea which is which. And you can imagine that the adversary even just flips a coin. Okay, so every day the adversary flips, and if it's heads, the top route has a traffic jam and has cost, cost one. If it's heads, then the bottom route costs one. And the other route is always zero. Okay? So any sequence of cost vectors generated in this way always has a zero on every day. So this is going to be zero at every, at every day t. Okay? There was always an action in hindsight with cost zero. Right? But as an algorithm designer, there's nothing you can do. Right? So you have to make a decision. The cost vector is equally likely to be one zero or zero one. So actually, no matter what decision you make, your expected cost will be one half every day. So your cost over all t days and expectation will be t over two, but in hindsight, there was something with cost zero. Okay? So the reason is that the adversary can enforce simultaneously 
this very strong notion of opt, zero, but your cost is at least t over two. Okay? And we want to do a lot better than that. Okay? So that's not gonna, we're not going to be satisfied with being t over two away from some benchmark. Okay? So here's a, here's a really, here's a really important, the most important definition of the lecture which is that of regret. It's a kind of regret called external regret. And the idea is basically to exchange this sum and this minimum. So rather than comparing to the optimal action sequence in hindsight, which can optimize separately for each day t, we're going to compare ourselves to the performance of the best fixed action. Okay, so someone who has knowledge of all of the cost vectors but plays exactly the same action day after day. So we're going to look at the time average, although that's not especially important. And we say, well, let's look at how well an algorithm does. All right, so this is your cost. And then with the benefit of hindsight, so notice the min's on the outside now. Let's ask, how well could we do with a fixed strategy. Okay. So this quantity is called the regret of an algorithm on a given sequence of cost vectors. Okay, so the adversary generates the CTs. Your algorithm generates the actions, the ATs. And this difference, the extent to which your cost is higher than the best fixed action is called the regret. This is the only, whenever I say regret in lecture, this is what I'll mean. Let me just mention a couple of modifiers. So there are various notions of regret. We'll look at a different one on, on uh, Wednesday. This, this version is called external regret. And uh, obviously I'm time averaging. And I'll do that throughout the lecture. You could also speak about the cumulative regret if you wanted by hiding the normalization factor, but it wouldn't make a big difference. Okay. So rather than comparing to this overly strong benchmark, we're going to compare. The goal is going to be to get the regret as low as possible, ideally very close to zero. Okay. Now you might ask, you know, why is this a good thing to do? Why is this a good definition, a good benchmark? There's a few reasons. First of all, it's just, it's sort of, you know, the sweet spot where it's tractable. Okay, I'll give you an algorithm that achieves very low regret today. But secondly, it's really non-trivial. And we'll go through a couple more lower bounds governing what we could hope for. And we'll see that there's a sense in which you can't do much better than getting close to this benchmark. Okay, so it's the right benchmark for give, giving you algorithms to make smart decisions uh, in the face of an unknown future. Okay. Yeah, question? So in this minimizer, without loss, you can focus on a pure action by linearity. So if you, you could make it mixed strategies, but it wouldn't, wouldn't change the definition. All right. So this is the benchmark. Second thing is, in our algorithm, even for this weaker benchmark, we're going to need to be randomized. So deterministic algorithms, by which I mean choosing the distribution PT to put all of its mass on a single action, that's not going to work. At least it's not going to work as well as we'd like. In fact, it's deterministic algorithms that really kind of expose how harsh this model is to the algorithm designer. Right? 
So if your algorithm is deterministic, right, so that means you broadcast, you're going to play action three at this time step. So it's actually pretty obvious how an adversary should respond with a cost vector. Well, if you're going to play three, I'm going to make the cost of action three one, and I'm going to make the cost of every other action zero. Okay? So I'm going to ensure that you pick the unique worst action every single time step. That will result in the cost of the algorithm being t. You pay one every single time step. Now again, that wouldn't be a big deal if the benchmark was also t, but it's not, because all but one action is going to have cost zero every single time step. If you have n actions, the largest this could possibly be is t over n for n actions. Okay? So even for the binary action case, you're going to be off by at least a factor of, of two. Okay, so you're going to have one half time average regret. All right, so, so summarizing, adversary can force your cost to be equal t, while best fixed action is no worse than t over n. And again, that's, we're not going to be happy with guarantees of that form. We're going to want to actually get that thing very close to zero. Okay? Whereas here, it's much closer to n. All right, so last observation governing what we might hope for. Even if we just try to compete with external regret, and even if we use randomized algorithms, And this is sort of the sense in which I meant that this benchmark is non-trivial. Okay, it's not too easy in this certain sense. So I claim it's actually impossible for any algorithm. So I claim every algorithm suffers regret. First of all, positive regret in the worst case. And it grows like the square root of log n, n remembers the number of actions, over capital T, where T is the time horizon. Okay. Now to be clear, this is not that bad. As T grows large, this quickly goes to zero, okay, which is great, and that's what we're going to be shooting for. But it just still points out that even with respect to the regret benchmark, even using randomized algorithms, yeah, we're going to, you know, the best case scenario is to have that go to zero, and this governs how fast we could even possibly hope for it to go to zero. Okay? So let me just, I'm not going to prove this in detail, but let me just give you the idea. And I'm going to give you the idea for the binary strategy case, but exactly the same idea. So for the binary strategy case, we're only shooting for an omega of 1 over root t, lower bound. That's what we're going to give you. And uh, but the exact same idea for general n gives you the, the more general lower bound. So, and it's actually exactly the same idea as in the first observation, where we're going to think about the adversary Again, binary strategies, and the adversary is just going to pick cost vectors at random. It's either 1, 0, or 0, 1. Okay? 50, 50 each. So we argued before that any algorithm has expected cost t over 2. Okay? Because you don't know if the cost vector is 0, 1, or 1, 0. All right? Now, before, the reason that killed us is because our benchmark was too strong. And in hindsight, there was this optimal action sequence with cost 0. And that's certainly not true anymore. Okay, so now that we have a more sensible benchmark, that's fixed action in hindsight. It's not the case that the right-hand side there is zero. Certainly not. Okay? But it's not t over 2 either. Okay, it is going to be smaller than t over 2. All right? So, because what am I doing? I'm basically just flipping a sequence of capital T coins. If it's heads, the cost vector is 1, 0. If it's tails, the cost vector is 0, 1. Now, if you flip t coins, you're very unlikely to get exactly t over 2 heads. If I got exactly t over 2 heads, then both action 1 and action 2 would have cost t over 2. Each fixed action would actually be bad, t over 2. But if you flip t coins, right, there's a standard deviation involved. The expectation is t over 2. There's a standard deviation involved. And it's basically root t. Okay? Law of large numbers, 
binomial approximations, however you want to think about it. Okay, so you're going to get t plus minus root t heads when you flip t coins. So the better of these two actions, okay, so you have t plus root t of one of them and t minus root t of the other. So if you have t minus root t tails only, that says the action corresponding to the tails being zero, that will have cost in hindsight only t over 2 minus root t. Okay. So the right hand side, the better of the two possibilities will be with high probability root t better than the expectation t over 2, which is the expected cost of any algorithm. Okay, so adversary randomizes. CT equals 1, 0, or 0, 1. The expected algorithm cost is T over 2. Expected best action cost equals t over 2 minus theta of root t. So inside the bracket, it's going to be theta of root t. Then once we divide by t, we get theta of 1 over root t. Okay? So that's going to be the, the regret. Okay. So that's why we're not going to do better than this benchmark, and indeed, our regret is not going to approach zero any faster than at this rate, this function of n and t. Okay. All right. So, questions? Okay. So that's on the lower bound side. Let's switch to what we, that's what we can't do. Let's switch to what we can do. So, an algorithm, and to satisfy this definition, it's necessarily, as we now know, a randomized algorithm. It's called no regret if, no matter what the cost vectors are, the expectation, where the expectation is over the coin flips in the algorithm, it's a randomized algorithm. So if the expectation goes to zero, sorry, the expected regret goes to zero as t grows large. Okay. So this is not ruled out by any of our three observations. Okay, so if we have a randomized algorithm and we use regret, it's conceivable that our regret goes to zero as quickly as this with t. To be no regret, you just need to, it, it, all, it, all it insists is that this is the low of one, that this is going to zero as t goes to infinity. Okay. So in fact, I've stated this for a fixed set of cost vectors that the adversary in some sense chooses up front before anything, before the ball gets rolling. In fact, the no regret guarantee I'm going to show you holds even if these cost vectors are chosen adaptively by the adversary having seen what you played in the past. Okay? So that's our goal, to design no regret algorithms in this sense. So here's the main theorem. It's a theorem that's been discovered many different times, many different people in many different communities. So certainly one key name is Hanan, who was a game theorist, studied this in 57. Another key references Littlestone and Warmoth, and there are many others. So the conceptual takeaway here is actually you can achieve this goal. Okay, there are algorithms for which the regret goes to zero as you play the game sufficiently long. Moreover, they're simple, very lightweight, easy to implement, easy to think about. And something which, you know, I don't necessarily expect you to remember a month from now, but at least for today is extremely cool, is that you can even get an optimal 
regret bound with one of these simple algorithms. Okay? So even with regret going to zero as the square root of the logarithm of the number of actions over the time horizon t. Okay? And I will give you an algorithm that does indeed achieve this bound. So again, let me remind you when I say regrets, right? So this is that expression there. It's time averaged, and it's this notion of external regret with respect to the best fixed action. Okay? Also, don't forget n is the number of actions for this whole lecture. So maybe a better way to think about this is well, suppose you had some target on the regret. Okay, suppose you wanted to know, wanted to know how long you have to play a game and experiment before your regret is meeting some guarantee that you had in mind, some epsilon. So immediately from the form of this is if you want your regret to be at most epsilon, then you actually don't have to play the game that many rounds at all, considering. Okay? As soon as you play it log n, logarithmic in the number of your actions, over epsilon squared, your regret will have dropped to epsilon. Okay? So I need t. So I'm going to drop the constant, but basically log n over epsilon squared to get regret at most epsilon. Okay. And as a bonus, the algorithm itself is very natural, very simple. Okay. So it's an algorithm that has A lot of applications outside of algorithmic game theory. Some of you may even have seen it in an algorithms course. It's an algorithm called, uh, these days, you hear a lot of people call it multiplicative weights. Other names you sometimes hear are hedge, or randomized weighted majority. I mean, essentially, almost all no-regret algorithms follow two key principles. The first is, well, look, we know it got to be randomized, but it's clear we, you know, we shouldn't just choose an action uniformly at random every day. That'd be kind of stupid. You want to somehow be sensitive to how well actions have performed in the past. Okay? So you're going to choose different actions with various probabilities. And in some sense, the obvious thing to do is the, high, the better something's done in the past, the lower its cost in the past, the higher the probability you're going to play that with now. And it turns out many reasonable implementations of exactly that idea, play with probability higher as the past performance is better, work, and gives you a no regret guarantee. Okay, so that's point number one. Okay, pay attention to past performance to figure out what to do right now. Point number two, which is important not to get no regret per se, but to get the optimal bounds that we're going to strive for today, is, guys, when an action turns sour, if it used to be good and suddenly it's bad, Punish it aggressively. Okay? Start playing it with probability decreasing exponentially in how many rounds in a row it's performed poorly. Okay? That's not necessary for no regret, but that's necessary for the optimal balance. So the algorithm I'm going to show you, multiplicative weights, is you know, one of the simplest, most natural implementations you could think of of those two principles. So with each action, we will maintain a weight. Okay, and at all times, we're just going to be choosing actions with probability proportional to the weights. So the bigger an action's weight, the more likely you are to pick it. So think of the weight as a sort of credibility. Okay? Initially, we know nothing, so all actions are equally credible. As an action suffers cost over time, its credibility erodes. We decrease its weight, and therefore decrease the probability that we're going to pick it at the next time step. So the superscript denotes the day. So on day one, everything has weight one. Okay. So remember the setup. First, 
we pick a probability distribution, then we find out the cost vector that the adversary chose. Okay? So at a given time, we just choose a t. I'm sort of conflating the first and the third steps now. Okay, so the probability distribution is just the weights rescaled, so it's a probability distribution. And then, of course, at the end of the day, we're going to sample a t from that. So proportional to the weights. And then afterwards, when you're given the cost vector CT, you update, and the updates always decrease the weights. You decrease the weights by setting for a given action A, it's its old weight times 1 minus epsilon raised to the cost that it incurred on the previous day, or on the current day. Okay. Sorry. All right, so a couple things. So epsilon's a parameter, we'll choose it later. It's between 0 and 1 half. Think of it as a constant, you know, 0 0.01, 0 0.1, something like that. So certainly, this algorithm is not very long. Can't be that complicated, but let's get a little feel for it. So think about a fixed epsilon. Okay, we figured out how to choose it. And let's just imagine the costs were either 1 or 0. Okay, imagine a really simple case. Remember, we're assuming the real number is between 0 and 1. What if they were either 1 or 0? Well, so then every day t, what happens? Well, the actions that suffered zero loss retain their weight from the previous step. Okay? Any action that had a cost of 1 has lost some credibility, so we multiply its weight times 1 minus epsilon. Okay? Every time you incur a cost of 1, your weight's going to get hammered with this 1 minus epsilon factor. So your weight will be decreasing exponentially quickly with the number of 1s that you've incurred over, over time. Okay. So this is a, you know, one way to interpolate to real value zero one cost from that simple idea of either you keep the same weight or you multiply by one minus epsilon depending on if it's cost zero or cost one. Okay. So that's one piece of intuition. Let's think a little bit about epsilon and the role that it plays. So that gives us a nice knob to tune in this algorithm. Extrapolating between on the one hand just sort of randomly flailing around and doing what has been exactly the best thing in the past deterministically. If we set epsilon to be equal to zero, then the weights will never change. Okay? So we start with the uniform distribution. We'll always have the uniform distribution. So that just says play randomly till the, till the end of time. Okay? So that's one extreme, where epsilon is zero. Uh, if epsilon is one, this isn't defined. But if epsilon is very close to one, so this is tiny, then essentially what this algorithm is doing is it's deterministically playing the action that has the least amount of cost to this time. Okay? So that's going completely with past performance, and the epsilon equals zero is completely ignoring past performance, and epsilon gives us a knob to tune between the two. Okay? So the, closer epsilon, the smaller epsilon is, the more we do exploration. The closer epsilon is to one, the more we just do exploitation of actions that were good in the past. Okay? So obviously, this is, a, this is a very simple algorithm to implement. Uh, so pretty much, if you ignore bit, bit complexity issues, it clearly runs in linear time, uh, linear in the number of actions for each iteration. Right? You just have to maintain the weight, uh, one weight for each action. Okay. All right. And so the claim is, this algorithm, in fact, is no regret with the optimal regret bound. Okay. So that's the next that's the next step to prove that. Yeah. So in each time step you know the costs for all the actions? Yes. So remember the setup? It's probably not on the board anymore. You pick an action A, you pick a power distribution, the adversary shows you the cost vector, and then the action gets chosen. 
shows you the whole cost vector. Yep. So you know, if it's an investment situation, you basically look at the you look at the returns on everything, and you figure out what you would have got had you done any of your other investment strategies. If you're driving from home to work, you listen to the traffic report, figure out what the travel times were of the other roads, and you update weights for everybody accordingly. There is a model, which is also important. We may talk about it Wednesday, if I can fit it in, we'll see, called the bandit model, which is where you only learn the cost of the action that you played, and you do not learn the action of the uh, other, you do not learn the costs of the other actions. It turns out there are no regret algorithms even in the bandit model. The, the rate of convergence is worse. You have another N here, but it's still pretty amazing that even just learning the cost of the action that you played, you can still get a no regret guarantee. But today, every time step, you learn the cost, the counter, you know, sort of the counterfactual, what would have been the cost, whatever else you might have done. All right. So on to the proof. The proof is actually really slick. Very pretty proof. Basically what happens is we're going to have two simple ideas. And then to reconcile the two simple ideas, we just do a little computation and we'll be done. The trick, as always, with these kinds of guarantees is we have to relate what seem like two very different things, apples and oranges. On the one hand, the cost incurred by our algorithm, which is sort of making these decisions adaptively without knowing the future, and so that's the left-hand side here, we have to relate that somehow to this you know, different kind of object, the best fixed action in hindsight, knowing all of the cost factors. So the question is, how do we get those two objects in the same room? Okay. So these first two simple ideas are going to introduce a proxy namely the sum of the weights at a given time step that we can relate to each of the two quantities. Okay. So, a very important function to keep track of, I'm going to call it gamma, capital gamma sub t. This is the sum of the weights at time t. Okay. Because every action initially has weight 1, this is initially n on day 1, and it's only going down over the course of the algorithm. Okay? Action by action, it's only going down. So here's simple idea one. Well, in some sense, what are we worried about? Okay, what's the sort of scenario under which our regret might be really big? Well, a necessary condition is that there's some action which is really good. Right? If all the actions are terrible, basically there's nothing to do. Okay? So then there's no way we can't do well with respect to the benchmark. So if there's a good action, meaning one that has a low cost over time, well, then evidently, you know, if it hasn't incurred much cost over time, we haven't decreased its weight very much. Okay? So there's going to be this one really good action that itself has pretty big weight, and that obviously is a lower bound on the sum of all of the weights. Okay? So that's idea one. Let me write it down formally, though. So if there exists... a good fix action, a star, then gamma sub t, at the end of the day, is big. Again, just because a star's weight all by itself has to be big. Okay? So reason so we define opt to be the cumulative cost of this best fixed action A star. And at the end of the algorithm, so capital gamma on the last day, capital T, is lower bounded by the weight of A star at the end of the algorithm. And if you look at this, right, so what happens? So every time this action A star incurs some cost, we multiply its weight by 1 minus epsilon raised to the cost that it incurred. Okay, so it gets multiplied by this factor every single day. 
right? So if we just take all of those exponents, right, these all get multiplied together. So the costs just add in the exponent. So this is just going to be equal to the initial weight of A star times the product of all of these terms, which is just 1 minus epsilon uh, raised to this. Okay. Maybe I'll do this in two steps to make it more clear. So product over T, 1 minus epsilon, CT A star, this becomes the sum. The initial weight, remember, is 1. So this is just 1 minus epsilon raised to the opposite. Okay. Any questions about that? That's step one. So again, the two things we care about, we care about opt. This is what we're shooting for. That's the right-hand side. And we care about our algorithm. Okay, what I've done is I've related one of the two things we care about, opt, to this intermediate proxy of the sum of the weights. So I still have to relate our algorithm's cost to the sum of the weights. Good. All right. So conceptually, the idea of step one was this. Here, and this is really the key point. Okay, so this, this would be true. I mean, we've used sort of nothing about the algorithm or almost anything in this first part. So here's what's important about multiplicative weights. So we know the weights are always decreasing. Right? So action by action, they're always decreasing. So gamma is certainly always decreasing. But when multiplicative weights suffers large cost, it must be the gamma decreases rapidly, a lot. Okay, so what I want to do now is introduce a connection between the cost incurred by our algorithm at a given time step and the decrease, the rate of decrease in capital gamma and the sum of the weights at that same time step. Okay, and they're very intimately connected. So gamma sub t decreases exponentially fast in the expected cost of our algorithm of multiplicative weights. So here's what I mean exactly. So think about a time step t. Well, so we look at the distribution with which it picks the various actions. Okay, and we look at the cost of that action. So expanding using how these probabilities are defined in multiplicative weights, namely just proportional to the weights. This is just, again, so it's expanding the probability. So it's just the weight at time t of action A. And again, we normalize, so it's a probability distribution. What do we normalize by? We normalize by the sum of the weights. Okay, so that's that. Whereas, okay, so what I'm saying up here is about gamma decreasing. So let's think about gamma on day t plus 1 and relate it to what gamma was on the day before. Let's look at how rapidly it decreased. And hopefully, we're going to somehow be able to connect the rates of decrease with this. This is the expected cost of our algorithm. Okay, so this is what we want to relate to this proxy gamma. All right, so, so by definition, sum of the weights and we know how weights evolved, right? So the weight of an action A at time t plus 1 is just as weight of the previous day times 1 minus epsilon raised to whatever the cost was on day t. Some, you know, just graphing a few functions and looking at the graphs convinces you that we can take the cost down here as a multiply on the epsilon instead of the exponent. So I'm going to ask you to fill in the details of this. 
in the next exercise set, but those are elementary considerations. We can get the costs out of the exponent. And now, again, the whole point here has been to relate gamma t plus 1 to gamma of t. Gamma t is just the sum of these weights. Okay, so what we want here is we want that the new sum of the weights is the old sum of the weights multiplied by some factor less than 1, where the extent to which that factor is less than 1 is somehow related to the cost that multiplicative weights incurs at this time step. Okay? So this one, so that's the sum of the weights, so that's just the gamma sub t term. So the question is, how much below 1 are we? Okay, so how rapidly is gamma decreasing? Well, okay, let's squint a little bit here. So we've taken care of the one term. That's that one there. So let's look at the second term. Okay? The weight of an action, the epsilon is just a scalar, so take that out. Weight of an action times the cost of the action. All right, well, that, does, that is starting to look like what we care about, the expected cost of our algorithm. Here's the expected cost of our algorithm. Okay? It's exactly some of the actions, weight times the cost, except for this normalization factor, gamma. So the only difference between these terms and this term is we have an extra epsilon and we're missing the gamma sub t. Okay? So that means there's the gamma sub t. And, whoops, yeah. Right, good. Good. So epsilon gamma sub t where I'm just defining this to be this thing, okay? Our gamma sub t is the cost, the expected cost of mw at time t, okay? So what we have here is gamma times epsilon times little gamma. Okay, little gamma is this thing, so the big gammas can, uh, cancel out, and here's the c's and the w's. So that verifies this equation. Okay. So again, the high level point is just that, you know, we already knew that the sum of the weights had to be decreasing. What's really cool here is that the rate of decrease is intimately linked to the rate at which our algorithm experiences cost. Okay? So this introduces a fundamental connection between our algorithm's cost and the sum of the weights. And we already know how to relate the sum of the weights to the optimal. So, those are the two main ideas. So now we've related the two things that we care about, the two sides of the regret benchmark. So what this says is that the only way our algorithm can be incurring a lot of cost is for the sum of the weights, and in particular each individual weight, to be dropping extremely rapidly. From part one, we know that if there's a good fixed action, then the weight of that action alone has to be big. So if the total weight is small, it can only be that all fixed actions are bad. Okay, so the only way our algorithm incurs a lot of cost is if all of the fixed actions are also incurring a lot of cost. At a high level, that's what we've just established. Okay. But let's actually get, uh, let's actually figure out the bounds. So what have we just done? Okay, so from part one, we argued that the weight of a single action single-handedly lower bounds the sum of the weights at the end of the algorithm. And The culmination of point two was that this is how the sum of the weights evolves. Okay, at each time step, it gets multiplied by one minus epsilon times little gamma sub t times what it was before. So, that gives us this. Okay, where this is by one, and that's by two. This is the sum of the weights at the beginning of the algorithm. 
the reaction initially has weight one, so that is N. Okay. So we don't care about this, but we definitely care about these two sides. Okay. This is the cost of our algorithm expected at time t. So what we want to upper bound is the sum of these little gammas summed over t. And this is what we want to bound it by. Opt. Okay. All right, so clearly we want to take logs, since opt is up here. And so that splits this up. So this corresponds to the gamma 1 term. And then we get a log of 1 minus epsilon gamma t for each day t. Okay. So now we just need a deft little Taylor approximation, and we'll be good to go. So if you do the Taylor expansion, Taylor expansion of log of 1 minus x, this is what you'll get, minus x minus x squared over 2 minus x cubed over 3 and so on. And we want to use this expansion twice to get rid of these annoying logs. So here we want an upper bound. Okay, so we want to replace this by something that's only bigger. So this will be very easy. I'll just throw away all of the terms after the first one. Okay, those are all negative terms. That'll give me something only bigger up here. On this side, I want something to lower bound log of 1 minus epsilon. So these are all negative terms. So it might seem I need them all. But now using that epsilon is at most 2, actually I can get away with just taking the second term, doubling it. Okay? An extra x squared over 2 is bigger in magnitude than all the rest of the stuff combined. Okay? So I'm going to lower bound this by minus epsilon minus epsilon squared. I'm going to upper bound this by minus epsilon gamma t. Okay? So we have opt. Again, the lower bound of this, minus epsilon minus epsilon squared. And the upper bound here, minus epsilon gamma t. Maybe you thought, majoring in computer science, you were off the hook from Taylor expansions for the rest of your life. You were wrong. So, but now, now we're in great shape. So let's just reorganize a little bit. All right, so let's move. So remember, our algorithm cost is the sum of the gamma t's. Let's put that on the left side. We want an upper bound on it. We'll move the op term to the right side. So, sum t equal 1 to t gamma t. And again, remember, this is the expected cost of our algorithm. This is what we care about. So this is the most log n over epsilon plus, so I'm dividing through by an epsilon here, 1 plus epsilon. Okay. Now things are looking really good. This is finally kind of something we can, you know, relate to, have a cup of coffee with. Algorithm on the left-hand side, opt plus some error terms on the right-hand side. All right, I'm going to be, uh, so the question now is how to pick epsilon. Okay, so the smaller we make epsilon, the better this term, the worse that term. So there's going to be some sweet spot. So let me actually write this this way. So this is a very sloppy inequality. So here's that opt. This epsilon opt, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna upper bound opt by capital T. Okay. That's sloppy. Okay, it's true, but it's sloppy. Right? Remember, costs are bounded between zero and one. So now I'm just going to pick epsilon to equalize the two error terms. So that involves setting you know, that equal to that, or epsilon squared equal to log n over t, or epsilon equal to root log n over t. Let 
which gives us opt plus 2 times square root of t log t. Sorry, t log n. Okay. With that choice of epsilon. This is the place where I'm using the assumption that capital T is known a priori okay, in the analysis. Okay. So where epsilon is a parameter in multiplicative weights. Okay. So I set the parameter epsilon using knowledge of capital T. The exercise set will show you how to go beyond that. Okay. So dividing by T to get the regret. Um, we get it's at most... Two times the square root of log over t. Right. Which again, this is no algorithm can do better beyond a constant factor on this term, okay, as we discussed. And again, another way you might want to interpret this is if you have a target of regret epsilon, then you need to play the game for log n, where n is the number of your strategies, over epsilon squared rounds. Which again is really super reasonable. We might have even been happy with polynomial on n, and indeed the initial algorithms from the 50s, that's what they gave us. They gave us polynomial on n regret, but we can even get logarithmic in the number of strategies. So even if you have an exponential number of strategies in some sense, this is still a reasonable, reasonable bound. Okay. okay, so that's the theorem. Simple algorithms that are not merely no regret, but have regret going to zero very rapidly and as rapidly as the simple information theoretic lower bound would suggest. So questions about that? That's everything I had to say about the single player case. No, you'd want to think maybe about the following example. So top road is always congested, bottom road is always uncongested. So there's a fixed action which has zero, always by bottom, but always random will get you t over two. So you do definitely need to be sensitive to which algorithms performed better in the past. Well, it's a little more complicated than that. If you're an adversary trying to optimize, if you're trying to produce a worst case upper bound, you have to trade off the cost you force the algorithm to incur right now versus, first of all, how much it's going to incur later. But secondly, I mean, as you said, I mean, you also have to worry about the benchmark, right? I mean, if I just want to maximize the algorithm's cost subject to nothing, I can just have all cost always be one. But we've, I mean, we've very sensibly defined our performance to be, well, that's an easy case. So we're only worried about missing out on a smart strategy. So for the adversary to give us a bad example, it has to plant a smart strategy in there. But this algorithm will always adaptively find it if there is one. Okay. Any other questions about the single player case? One thing I should say is there's a lot of no regret algorithms out there. I showed you, you know, possibly the most ubiquitous one, multiplicative weights. Arguably, if you only knew one, this would be a good one to know. Uh, on problem set number four, the last problem uh, steps you through a different, really conceptually very different no regret algorithm that also has optimal bounds, which is also a very cool algorithm. So I encourage you to, to try that last problem on the problem set four as well. Okay? And there's others, there's others as well. Okay, so let's get back to games now. So now that we know what no regret algorithms are, and now that we know that we exist, they exist, it makes sense to define no regret dynamics. So, at, you know, at a high level, it's dynamics in the same way best response dynamics were dynamics. Uh, so there's two main differences. Where best response dynamics, we thought about the players going one at a time or taking turns. 
Um, here we're going to go ahead and each time step thinking about every player getting to move. That's not an essential assumption, but we'll, we'll use it for today. So there's synchronous decision making and no regret dynamics. And secondly, you know, as the names would suggest, rather than doing a best response when it's your turn to move, you play an action as advised by your favorite personal no regret algorithm. Okay. So each player I independently chooses a strategy. So SI at day T. Using a no regret algorithm A sub I. We're not going to care which one. We're not going to care if different players use different no regret algorithms. It doesn't matter. Okay? It just matters that every player somehow figures out how to get itself a no regret guarantee. Now, for a player to be running a no regret algorithm, right, so for example, multiplicative weights, it has to be evolving. It has to somehow feed cost vectors into this no regret algorithm. Right, so that's what a no regret no algorithm is by definition. It takes as input the cost vectors up to this point, and it returns to you a distribution over actions. Okay? So what cost vectors do we feed in? Does player I feed into its no regret algorithm A sub I? Well, at a given previous day T, it just looks at what the other players did on that day. That induces, let's think about cost minimization games like routing. Knowing other players' actions, that now induces a cost on each of your possible actions that you could have taken, okay, given what the other K-minus-1 players played. Okay? So the cost vectors you feed in are just those of your strategies given the actions chosen by the other K-minus-1 players. Okay? So, or if you like, you can think about it then in no regret dynamics. After choosing an action at day T, player I is given a report about what cost each of his actions would have been, okay, now that we know what everybody played. Okay, so in cost minimization game terminology, it's your cost function indexed by your own strategy and given the actions played by everybody else on day T, okay, as advised by their own no regret algorithms. So this is now enough for each player to run their no regret algorithm. Okay, so this is now well-defined dynamics with respect to the AIs. Okay. All right, so now I want to talk about you know, what guarantees can we state about no regret dynamics. Is the definition clear? Absolutely does. So you look at what the other K-1 players did. Okay, so at the beginning of day T, everybody independently chooses an action. Okay, then after everybody's chosen their actions, now I can go back and ask, oh, well, given what they all did, what cost would I have gotten for each of my actions? That is the cost vector. Okay. And again, as dynamics go, remember, these, these are potentially very lightweight. Okay, so if you're a player and your only responsibility is maintaining these weights on every action, not very burdensome in, most, in many situations. All right, so that means it would be cool if there were any guarantees you could state on these dynamics, and there are. In fact, we're gonna be able to relate no regret dynamics to what we introduced a while back as a static equi equilibrium concept, an equilibrium concept for one-shot games, coarse correlated equilibria. Okay. So let me now make a connection between the outcomes that result from no regret dynamics when a game is played over and over and over again to a coarse correlated equilibrium of the game when it's played only once. So theorem So run no regret dynamics, and suppose the outcome sequence that results over capital T days is S1 up to ST. So each of these, again, is just one outcome. OK? 
Okay, it's a particular strategy profile. Here's how I get a distribution. Okay? I just look at the empirical distribution of these outcomes. So in other words, I'm going to define sigma as the uniform distribution over these outcomes. Okay? So it's clear what I mean if the outcomes are all distinct, right? Uniform distribution over these outcomes. Uh, if there's multiplicities, I just pick with proportional to the frequency. Okay? So if one outcome appears once, another outcome appears two different times in two different days, I pick the latter outcome with twice as much probability. Okay? So sigma is the uniform distribution over the multi-set of the outcomes. Okay? So that's a distribution over outcomes. So this is the kind of thing we were saying could be a correlated equilibrium or could be a coarse correlated equilibrium. I'll remind you the exact definition in a second. Okay? So the point is, given a sequence of outcomes, I can define a distribution over outcomes in this natural way using frequencies. So then, I'll just say it informally sort of for now, sigma is an approximate coarse correlated equilibrium. Okay. So I'll state the formal definition in a second, but just to remind you, we had this Venn diagram picture. We had our hierarchy of equilibria, pure equilibria, mixed equilibria, correlated equilibria, and the biggest set of all, so the most permissive set of all was the coarse correlated equilibria. Okay? So we're not arguing that no regret dynamics is in any sense converging to a Nash equilibrium. We're just saying the empirical distribution of joint play, well, at least it's not arbitrary. It does at least lie within this biggest set, this coarse correlated equilibrium set. As far as the formal definition of an exact coarse correlated equilibria, it was for all i. Basically, it looks exactly like the Nash equilibrium condition, except you have this joint distribution sigma. Okay, so you think about every possible deviating player i, every possible unilateral deviation si prime. And it should be the case that the expected cost, when an outcome is chosen at random, from the distribution of our outcomes is at most that if the player in all cases deviated to SI prime. Okay. So this is the definition of a coarse quoted equilibrium from lecture 14. Again, maybe you were thinking it at that point as the biggest set in our hierarchy. This is also the equilibrium concept for which we proved that the price of anarchy guarantee of smooth games extends automatically out to this equilibrium concept. The lambda over 1 minus mu, even though it seemed like it was about pure equilibria, the smallest set, we give a proof in lecture 14 that it holds to every equilibrium of this type. Okay. All right. So because of that, and the details of this, I'll prove this theorem in a second, it's simple. But because of this connection, because the sequence, the outcome sequence generated by no regret dynamics is essentially a coarse correlated equilibrium up to some small error, and because we know that our price of anarchy guarantees, at least for smooth games, which it covers everything we've ever seen in this class, extends automatically to coarse correlated equilibrium, it says that whatever it is no regret dynamics generates, again, at least in a smooth game, actually this, the price of anarchy bounds we've been talking about automatically apply, always. So this is under a lot less assumptions than we had on Wednesday for best response dynamics when we were talking just about potential games. Okay, so here we don't have any assumption of potential games. An example of a non-potential game that we might care about would be routing games where different players have different weights. Okay, those don't have potentials. And, but they are smooth games, it turns out. And so again, no regret dynamics automatically gives you outcome sequences whose cost is as small as the bound that we proved for Nash equilibria. Okay. All right, so corollary smooth POA bounds apply a 
approximately to no regret dynamics. Okay? So it's in the spirit of the result we finished Wednesday's lecture with, saying that when you use best response dynamics, or at least a particular version of best response dynamics, the max gain version, and you have a game which is both smooth and a potential game, it's as good as being at a Nash equilibrium. Here we're saying if you have a game that's smooth, it doesn't have to be a potential game, any form of no regret dynamics, okay, without any further conditions, then again, the objective function performance is as good as what we've been proving for Nash equilibria, okay, for smooth games. All right, but again, the formal statement will appear on exercise not set nine. So rather, I want to wrap up the lecture just with the short proof of this theorem. Frankly, it's really just writing down the two definitions and noticing that they're the same, but it's an important point, so I want to make sure you all get it. So consider player I. Okay, so we're back, we're back here. We're thinking about this game. It was played over capital T time steps. Each of the players was using its own favorite no regret algorithm. So suppose player I has regrets Ri at the end of the day. Okay. You know, by which I mean the time average cost it actually incurred over capital T days was perhaps as much as Ri more than that of the best fixed action, fixed strategy in hindsight. So what does this mean? Uh, right. So this is just writing the definition again. write it this way. All right, so this is just the definition of regret. Okay, that's all this is, the definition of regret. Now remember, what, we're, what is it that we're trying to argue is a course correlated equilibrium or almost. It's this distribution sigma, which is just we look at the capital T outcomes, S1 through S capital T, and we just look at the uniform distribution over them. So if you look at this, <coughs> another name for this is just, for this definition of sigma, the uniform distribution over the capital T outcomes, for that distribution sigma, this is just the expected cost of player I with respect to that distribution. Same thing. Okay? It's just the uniform distribution over the capital T outcomes. It's literally just doing a time average. Okay? This sigma is literally just doing a time average. Similarly, <clears throat> for a fixed SI prime, and imagine the one over, you know, with the one over T normalization, this is just equal to the expected value if I choose S at random from the capital T possible outcomes of how well player I would do with that particular deviation. Okay, so the correspondence here is in the regret benchmark of fixed action independent of the day T is translating over here to a unilateral deviation which is independent of the sample from sigma. Okay, so there's an exact correspondence between how in course quality equilibria, you only look at fixed unilateral deviations, SI prime, unconditioned on anything else. So that's different than correlated equilibria, where you can condition your deviation on your recommendation. So here there's the correspondences between these fixed, these uh, single unilateral deviations, unconditional, in course quality equilibria, and the fixed actions in the external regret benchmark. So the upshot then, is that the regret 
experienced by one of these players over this outcome sequence is exactly the approximation error in the equilibrium condition. So, star holds up to an error of Ri, and because everybody's running a no-regret algorithm, the regret i is going to zero, possibly very quickly, if you're using multiple good weights, for example, as t goes to infinity. So the takeaway here is that this gives a very strong argument for, at the very least, coarse correlate equilibria being a plausible and robust prediction of player behavior, really in any game. Okay, so players can use these very lightweight algorithms, a linear time per iteration, and very quickly, okay, even just with log over epsilon squared iterations, all players have regret at most epsilon. That translates to joint play being very close to of course, correlate equilibrium. So unlike the intractability of things like Nash equilibria, which we'll talk more about next week, this is a strong tractability result for coarse correlate equilibria. As a consequence, price of anarchy bounds for coarse correlate equilibria, like those we talked about a few lectures ago, are very robust. You don't need assumptions of convergence beyond just the no regret guarantee for that uh, price of anarchy bound to be valid. So more on regret on Wednesday. See you then.